Today we'll be looking at a case from the very end of the 19th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Alice Sterling was born in Boston in 1887. She was the second youngest daughter of six children, four girls and two boys. Born to Mr George and Mrs Alice Sterling, the family lived in a modest house at 47 Savon Hill Avenue and Alice's father had his own barber shop nearby at 1120 Dorchester Avenue. He worked hard to provide for his young family while Alice's mother managed the household. The family lived a modest life and did many things together. In the late afternoon they would often go out for walks and in the evenings they all liked to sit down and read. On Sundays they would go to church. It was an exciting time to live in Boston. Electric streetcars had been introduced in 1889 which made getting around the city easier and brought a touch of modern convenience to people's everyday routines. Familiar landmarks like the Boston Common and the State House were very important while industry and education continued to advance. The construction of the Tremont Street subway began in 1895, which was one of the first subway systems in the United States. The innovation was part of the city's efforts to alleviate congestion in the downtown area by moving streetcars underground. The project marked a significant step forward in Boston's public transportation infrastructure, reflecting the city's commitment to modernization. Of course, all of this was not something that the younger Sterling children were deeply aware of. They were more focused on their own daily lives, attending school and enjoying time with their friends. The days were filled with simple pleasures of childhood, playing in the neighbourhood and exploring their surroundings. Early on Wednesday the 10th of April 1895, Mrs Sterling had to go to the city of Everett to visit her sister, a distance of about six miles. Alice did not go with her mother, instead she stayed with her father and played happily outside his barber shop while Mr Sterling attended to the steady flow of customers. Alice was a bright and happy natured child and known to virtually everyone in the neighbourhood. Although Alice was mainly running about outside, Mr Sterling made sure that he could always see her. She liked to play with her doll, but also had a bicycle that she would occasionally attempt to ride. Every so often she would come into the shop. Everyone knew her and would take time to say hello. However, at about 3pm, Mr Sterling looked out of the window and noticed that his little daughter had gone. At first, he didn't think much of it, but as time passed, his concern grew. He returned to the house hoping to see her, but Alice was not there. He now started to become quite worried. However, it was not until Mrs Sterling arrived home that they actually started looking for the missing girl. Along with their three other daughters and two sons, they made their way to the homes of friends and neighbours, asking them if they had seen Alice. But everyone they spoke to told them that they had not. Mrs Sterling saw a local policeman named Officer Perkins, and he assisted in the search. When they failed to find the little girl, or gain any clue as to where she might be, Officer Perkins reported the disappearance to his commanding officer. The police were quick to act, treating a missing child as a serious matter, they immediately launched an investigation, gathering witness statements and combing through the neighbourhood for any clues. A description of Alice was circulated across the city, but despite an exhaustive search of South Boston and Dorchester waterfronts, there was no trace of the little girl. However, shortly after, a witness came forward to say that they had seen Alice with a man on Savon Hill Avenue, heading towards the marshlands of South Boston. The man was described as tall and stout, and the witness said that the girl appeared to be untroubled in his presence. Alice was described as small for her age, with a light complexion and a birthmark above her eyebrow. When she disappeared, she was wearing a broad brimmed brown felt hat, a brown dress and black stockings. The police distributed this description to all the newspapers. Despite the great efforts to find Alice, her parents were in a state of deep distress and feared the worst for their beloved daughter. The investigation soon uncovered some interesting witnesses. A lady named Mrs Tupper reported seeing a man holding a child's hand on Savon Hill Avenue at around 3pm on the Wednesday that Alice went missing. She said that she also saw them on the corner of Auckland Streets and later on Midland Streets. Another lady named Mrs Harding said that she had seen a little girl and a man heading towards a railroad depot. But the most significant sighting came from Mr Jewett, the railroad agent. He recognised the man with Alice to be Mr Angus Gilbert. He told officers that he saw them both on the railroad platform, though surprisingly, Mr Gilbert didn't acknowledge him 
which was strange, as in the evenings they worked together at the station. Angus Gilbert had come to Boston from Nova Scotia in Canada. He was 28 years old and worked as a handyman on the Emmons estate in Dorchester. His duties were simple but physically demanding, consisting of tasks like chopping wood, carrying water and performing other odd jobs around the property. In exchange for his labour, he was provided with a small salary and a basic room and boards. However, Mr Gilbert's day didn't end there. At night he had a second job as an assistant station agent at the nearby railroad depot. His living quarters were modest. He stayed in a small room within the estate's barn, which although once bustled with livestock, had become largely abandoned over time, but he had made his accommodation as pleasant as possible. When Officer Perkins learned of Mr Gilbert's living situation, he began to piece together a troubling possibility. The officer believed that Mr Gilbert may have taken Alice to the barn by a strange route to try and avoid being seen. The barn's isolation and its proximity to Mr Gilbert's daily work made it a plausible location for him to hide a young girl without drawing any immediate suspicion. Around two o'clock in the afternoon, on Saturday the 13th of April, Officer Perkins, now convinced that Angus Gilbert was involved in the girl's disappearance, decided to arrest him. The two knew each other reasonably well, and when the officer informed him that he would be arrested, Mr Gilbert remained calm and just said that he had no knowledge of what had happened to Alice. He was then escorted to the police station. Shortly after, Officer Perkins and Officer Smith returned to the barn. In Mr Gilbert's room, they found whiskey bottles and bloody handkerchiefs. A pair of trousers matching the description of those worn by the man last seen with Alice were also folded neatly and appeared to have bloodstains upon them. The officers then focused their search on the cellar. After turning over manure in one section, but finding nothing, they moved on to an area used for storage. While pressing his feet on the ground near a partition, Officer Perkins noticed a soft spot in the earth he began to dig, and just a few inches down, he uncovered a child's button boots. But he was startled, as moments later a leg appeared. He dug some more, and to his horror, lay the body of a little girl. She lay face down, and her clothes matched the description of those that Alice Sterling had been wearing on the day that she disappeared. The grim discovery confirmed the officer's worst fears. The mystery of the missing girl had ended in the most brutal way. News of the find spread quickly, drawing large crowds to the scene, though a heavy police presence, organised by Captain Myrick, managed to keep the onlookers away from the barn. By now, the cellar where the body had been found had taken on an eerie and sombre atmosphere. When the doctor looked at the body, he saw that it was undisturbed, still lying in the shallow grave. However, his examination revealed severe injuries. The left side of Alice's head was badly crushed and there was a noticeable gruesome lump above her right eye. Initially, medical examiner Draper thought that the child's injuries might have been caused by a heavy stone since there were several such stones nearby. But this theory was dismissed when during a search upstairs, Officer Dinsmore came across a large axe. When the axe was looked at closely, bloodstains could be seen, particularly near the blade. There are also clumps of hair on it, which were the same colour as the young girl's. Dr Draper decided to have the axe carefully wrapped and sent to Professor Woods at Harvard for further analysis. After the post-mortem examination had been completed, doctors confirmed everyone's worst fear. Alice had been abused before she was murdered. When officers informed the family that Alice was dead, the household was engulfed in grief. The air seemed to grow heavy as the reality of their loss began to sink in. Officer Perkins arrived at the house and found Mr George Sterling comforting his daughter Gertie while the other children sat weeping nearby. His youngest daughter, just four years old, wandered through the house with a puzzled expression, too young to grasp the tragedy that had shattered their world. In the next room, Alice's mother lay in a fragile condition. The devastating news of her daughter's murder had struck her with such force that she had collapsed and had required the attention of a doctor. Despite receiving this most tragic news, Mr George Sterling managed to maintain some composure. Speaking hesitantly to officers, he said, I cannot understand how anyone could commit such a terrible act. I do not have any enemies, at least none that I am aware of. When Alice first went missing, I hoped that she might have been taken for ransom, given how bright and beloved she was. But the thought that she was murdered is beyond anything I can comprehend. 
Angus Gilbert was questioned by investigators. He provided his account of the events of Wednesday the 10th of April. He stated that he was at the barber's shop at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. After leaving, he claimed that he went straight to Mrs Emmons' house on Savin Hill Avenue, where he spent the time alone and had dinner at 6 o'clock. By 7 o'clock, he said that he had already arrived at his job at the railroad station. While he admitted to seeing Alice in the barber's shop, he denied being involved in her disappearance. In an attempt to try and get more information from Mr Gilbert, he was taken by police to the barn and to the place where the little girl had been buried. However, he remained expressionless and continued to deny any involvement in the crime. As police continued to question him, he told them that he had known the Sterling family for about four years and that he often visited their home. He said that he considered Mr Sterling to be a good friend and would never harm any of his children. Mr Gilbert had never been arrested before. The police could find no records of him in their files and those who knew him said that he seemed to be an honest and hard-working man, although he did like to talk to all the young ladies, especially at the railroad station, and he was also known to drink. He was originally from Halifax, in Nova Scotia in Canada, and his parents had been well regarded by their community. His father still lived there, but sadly his mother died when he was 19 years old, and following her death, he went to live in Boston, the city where his sister Jenny had come to live several years earlier. It was said that he didn't have many close friends, though he knew many people, and the friends that he did have seemed to be honest and well respected. Angus Gilbert continued to deny that he had committed the murder. He told officers that his memory of Wednesday the 10th of April was blurred, as he had been drinking, but he did know that he had not killed Alice Sterling. As the police continued to question him and present him with witness statements from people who confirmed that they had seen him with the little girl, he eventually changed his story. He claimed that on the morning of Thursday the 11th of April, he went to the cellar of the barn to fetch a pitchfork when he stumbled upon the little girl's lifeless body. He said that he did not know what to do in fear that he would be blamed for the crime. So instead of telling someone that he had found Alice, he buried her. After telling this to officers, he conceded that in hindsight, he should have spoken up immediately as he was completely innocent. The police did not believe this story and Mr Angus Gilbert was charged with murder. The trial began in the Superior Criminal Court in Sussex County on Monday the 24th of June 1895 before judges Dunbar and Sheldon. The courtroom was bustling with activity, filled to capacity with spectators and journalists, all eager to get a glimpse of the accused. Outside, the crowd jostled for position, hoping that they might be allowed to view the proceedings. Mr Angus Gilbert wore a dark blue suit, a light blue tie and a white shirt. He was certainly dressed to make an impression, though his polished appearance did little to ease the tension or diminish the watchful eyes upon him. He pleaded not guilty, and his attorney, Mr Doherty, aimed to prove that his client was actually insane. The prosecution presented a detailed account of Mr Gilbert's movements on the day that Alice Sterling went missing. They introduced witnesses who had seen him both before and after the little girl disappeared. Among these witnesses were Alice's father, Mr George Sterling, Mrs Tupper, who reported seeing a man holding a child's hand on Savin Hill Avenue that afternoon, and Mrs Harding, who had observed a child and a man heading towards the railroad depot. Additionally, Mr Jewett, the railroad agent, was brought in to testify about seeing the defendant with Alice, but it was the testimony of Mrs Sterling, the mother of the murdered child, that caused the most profound commotion in the courtroom. As she faced Mr Gilbert, who sat in the defendant's dock, she made a passionate and emotional accusation as she shouted, Upon my soul and heart, that man sitting there has killed my daughter, my darling child. She cried out hysterically, pointing at Mr Gilbert with trembling hands as she struggled to hold back her tears. Throughout her cross-examination, Mrs Sterling found it difficult to respond calmly due to her overwhelming grief. As she was led away, she continued to shout, He murdered her, my Alice, my angel child, he murdered her. She tried to reach over to the dock to seize the defendant, but she was restrained by a court officer. The scene was later described in the newspapers as dramatic and tragic and completely unforeseen. Following the outburst, Mr Doherty moved for a mistrial, claiming that Mrs Sterling's actions had unfavourably affected the minds of the jury, who now could no longer be relied upon to give a fair and impartial verdict. The judges considered the request for a few moments, but denied it, and the proceedings continued. 
The defence then brought in witnesses from Nova Scotia who knew the Gilbert family. Their testimonies conclusively showed that Angus Gilbert's father had struggled with alcoholism and that a maternal uncle had been confined to the insane asylum at Dartmouth since 1877. It was also shown that two of his cousins had intellectual disabilities and that an aunt had suffered from recurring bouts of religious melancholy and dementia for several years. The defence followed this up by presenting experts in the field of mental illness, all of who insisted that after examining Mr Gilberts, they believed him to be insane. They said that his condition rendered him incapable of understanding or controlling his actions, thus absolving him from any responsibility for the crime. The experts emphasised that Mr Gilbert's mental state at the time of the incidents was such that he could not have been fully aware of the nature or consequences of his actions. The defence presented these testimonies extremely effectively and when all the witnesses had finished, whispers of doubt and uncertainty could be heard rippling through the gallery. The impact of the revelations about Mr Gilbert's family history and the expert medical witnesses seemed to leave many in the courtroom questioning whether he may indeed be insane, casting a shadow over the prosecution's case. However, the prosecution presented their own expert medical witnesses who contradicted the defence's claims. In these doctors' testimonies, they insisted that in their opinion, Mr Gilbert had shown no signs of insanity and that the crime couldn't have been driven by an epileptic or manic episode. They also informed the courts that they had each interviewed the defendant on multiple occasions since his arrest. The trial lasted for four days, and on the 28th of June, the jury was sent out to deliberate. They did so for just one hour and 25 minutes, before returning with their verdict. They found the defendant, Mr Angus Gilbert, guilty of first-degree murder. When this verdict was announced, the gallery erupted in applause, but this was soon suppressed, and the courtroom once again became silent. The judge then sentenced Mr Angus Gilbert to death by hanging. The case was appealed, prompting the governor to order additional medical evaluations of Mr Gilbert. All these reports concluded that he was not insane. On the morning of the 21st of February 1896, Mr Gilbert, accompanied by his sister Jenny, attended a religious service in the prison before he was escorted to the gallows. He remained calm and at 10.40am the trapdoor was opened and Angus Gilbert was hanged. Ever since his arrest, he maintained that he was innocent and never confessed to the crime. Later that day, his body was released to his sister for burial. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.